Hello and welcome to Unsourced Wall. My name is Elvis and as always, I am your host. Okay, so this is going to be kind of a short one. There's not a lot to talk about this week. And the things I do talk about, well, we'll get to that later. But overall, let's just try to get through this smoothly and hopefully it'll be a little bit fun. There's really only one news topic that I want to talk about this week because it was something that I've been really anticipating and I'm just glad to have some more news about it that I can really get into. And that news topic is that apparently Spike Lee is going to be directing the long-awaited Prince of Cats movie. I've been anxious about this movie ever since the project was first announced earlier this year and I have to admit hearing that Spike Lee is going to be helming it is a bit of a mixed bag. I can see why the choice was made. Spike has made his name on being this cinematic poet of urban New York, specifically Brooklyn, a setting that lives and breathes within Prince of Cats. It's the entire sort of aura and personality of it. Coupled with Lee's tendency to indulge in semi-tangential soliloquies or spoken word out of context asides to the audience, prevalent in more of his personal films like Do the Right Thing or She's Gotta Have It, which is a good stylistic fit for the interludes and sonnets that litter the graphic novel as well, a tribute to its roots as a Shakespearean play so I have no doubt that he'll do wonders with that as it was one of my concerns when the movie was first announced and confirmed because it's one of those things where you get to ride the fine line and it's something that can be distracting when you don't handle it really well and Spike Lee to his credit has already done things like this before. My concerns about this news however stem from everything else. Ron Wimberly's graphic novels, kinetic, fluid, hyper reality, fever dream, akin to the warriors, streets of fire, Akira, or redline. Its visuals are just as important and maybe even more so than the writing, showcasing a bright array of loud, arresting colors and a perspective and look with its characters in action that feels smooth, quick, untethered, and incredibly over the top, which isn't the kind of director that Spike Lee is. It's not the sort of thing that he does. It's something more along the lines of what Robert Rodriguez would be doing. Spike has a very staunch eye with solid framing and pretty steady shot construction. He doesn't have the sensibility to get at the heart of Prince of Cats in terms of the action, look, design, and camera movement. I hope I'm wrong and that he does delve right into unfamiliar territory for himself, but I'm cautious. I hope that whatever he's able to do captures the spirit and attitude of the comic at least. If it can, maybe it will be as cool and as impactful as the comic was because it is a truly unique and incredible vision. That is truly all its own and not just a standard retelling. Fingers crossed and I hope that it all works out. Moving ahead to what I read this week, we have Hawkman, which is pretty much the only thing I picked up this week. I'm glad to say that kind of threw me for a loop. It's not the best issue, but it's definitely more interesting than I was expecting. I've been pretty let down by this arc so far, and I stand by my opinion that the transition into event tie-in was limply and clumsily handled, which is why it's so strange to me that this is how they decided to play with it when all the previous issues did was make it sound like rushed and forced character development. Because rather than being infected and feeding into his worst impulses, Hawkman in this issue is actually just being possessed by the ghost of his Earth 3 counterpart. And that's kind of an amazing premise. Like you don't even need the event as an excuse to do this. It's just a bonkers but completely amazing concept to hang a story around. Like you could have done this at any point and it would have been just as insanely interesting. I'm, I'm all for it. I really am. I love that idea and the issue takes more than enough advantage of it. From this fun flashback to Earth 3 with such luminaries as the Pinkerton Ghost and Shadow Sheriff to Carter fighting his possession as his own ghost. It's goofy, which is miles better than Ape Man attempt at delving into his raffle side, which was being hinted at like the last three issues. I think it really fumbled at it, or would have fumbled at it if that's what it turned out to be. That's still a theme that I would like to see come about, but maybe not when it's at the mercy of status quo shakeups. It's not a perfect issue. It's still pretty flimsy and at the behest of outside forces, but it's light enough and has a good enthusiasm for the wackiness that it's throwing out there. I hope the rest of this arc can flow on through until the storm passes, because it might still have some life left. This was a pretty decent issue, if a bit standard, but I'll take standard over dragged out, rushed, and just completely tattered by the event machine. Overall, one thumb middle, one thumb up. Moving right on toward what I watched this week, we only have one thing because I dropped Titans and I have absolutely no intention of ever seeing that show again. We have Watchmen episode 4, if you don't like my story, write your own. Which is another simply okay episode. I really have no genuine attachment to this series or to these characters. It's just decent, it's well made, it's well acted, and has some good gags. But in terms of arcs, narrative, progression, or even the slightest bit of immersion, it's lacking spirit. 
There's no real hook to this show outside of it being Watchmen. There's no reason it's giving the audience to continue watching outside of, well, what's happening? And not even in a cool way like Lost did in its final seasons, where it was just shoving dozens of crazy things per episode. Lost in the last couple of seasons was still really boring, but at least it felt like it had some anima. This, this really doesn't. I can name a gag or two I thought was fun, like Ozymandias catapulting his servants into nothingness or looking glass waxing poetic about the alien baby squids but those are just examples in isolation it's just not that interesting when strung all together the next episode is going to be the midway point through this season and i can't really give you a clear answer as to what happened so far because it doesn't feel like anything significant in terms of characters or their personal journeys the stuff you stay with a show for has happened to put it simply the show just feels really blah like it's completely washed out I'll stick with it to the end of the season, but overall, it's bringing nothing to the table, and that's a shame. The next episode is apparently an origin story to Looking Glass. I think that his actor is an amazing character actor, so hopefully we get something worth talking about. Overall, two thumbs middle. Alright, so now we can head on to listener questions. We have actually two this week. Our first one is from the amazing at Mitch Gosler on Twitter. And their question is, what is my favorite young animal book? And this would have been a tough one if there hadn't been one series that I completely forgot was even a young animal book until the last second. Because young animal as an imprint is a pretty varied stock for something that is minimal in terms of the actual titles it's been going out with. From Doom Patrol to Shade the Changing Girl to Cape Carson, it does its best to make each one of those pretty damn unique. Some don't really hit with me or catch my interest, but one actually did. And very surprisingly too, because I wasn't expecting it at all. And that one would have to be Bug, The Adventures of Forager. Because not only was it this quasi ambush bug romp through the DC Universe, particularly the Simon and Kirby era, but it also somehow ended up dovetailing Starlin's Cosmic Odyssey New Gods trash into something actually poignant and more in line with what Kirby had in mind for the characters and their own emotional arcs. It was like a reevaluation and felt very fitting for everyone involved. It was very sweet, which is not something that I would ever say about Starlin's New Gods schlock in general, but it bridged that distance and I am just so grateful that it did because, well, it's good to know that at the very least, that story has something that was actually worthwhile that came out after it and not just Starlin's insane hackneyed ideas. So yeah, that would have to be my favorite of Young Animal. So thank you for that question, Mitch. And it was really fun just reliving and rethinking about the final issues of Bug because they really did stick out to me and I really enjoyed them so much. Next up, we have a question from the ever great awesome illuminated i'll put all the links below check them out they're amazing and their question is what is my favorite hawkman incarnation well let's just get out of the way hawk world hawk world was amazing it felt like the actual reinvention of the character that at that point in time with all of this man of steel and year one hoopla well it felt like what hawkman deserved it was bold and it brought something new to the character and i think that most incarnations since then have paid some deference or tribute to it in some way so yeah it's great. It's an all-time classic. Personal favorite though, Nighthawk. Simply because of the idea, the conceit, and if there was a dedicated miniseries based on Nighthawk and Cinnamon, I'd be there. It's just nice to see a Hawkman and Hawkwoman that are so simple. Like, they're just cowboys. No superheroes or aliens or royalty. It really puts the whole reincarnation thing into perspective, and I think it kind of grounds it a bit, which is really fascinating. Honestly though, a lot of times the reincarnation angle is played for a lot of gags, or at least like one-off jokes or references or sort of little reveals, and that's why I really like the first season of Venditti's Hawkman series because it really tries to delve out a little bit more and have them more connected even though it does end up doing a lot of the whole gag stuff anyway. And I hope that this season, after it gets through the event, continues to bring up more and explore more the incarnations because, well, that's Hawkman and Hawkman is one of the characters you can actually do that with and have it make some sort of sense. But yeah, Cowboy Hawkman and Hawkworld. I mean, what else is there? So thank you for that question, Illuminated. It was really fun and, well, Hawkman is a character that I don't think there's ever been a truly bad version of i mean discounting the time he was a flame elemental and was native american or something i mean that was a whole mess but really he's a character that is both so simple but also really really interesting to explore and that's what gives him his charm so thank you for that it was really fun to talk about and i just want to say thank you to you both these were amazing questions and it was just well it was really really entertaining to try and parse things out so thank you both so much 
It means a lot. And I hope that my answers were satisfactory in any kind of way. So I really appreciate it. And I just want to say thank you to anyone out there who's ever sent in a question, comment, or topic to the show. It means so much to me. And I just really am just so humbled by it. So again, thank you all so much. And if anyone out there has their own question, comment, or topic they want to hear discussed on the show, you can always find me on Twitter at T-H-E underscore S-N-I-C-K-M-A-N. And I want to give a shout out to the cover artist at D-O-T-E-M-C-E. Please check them out. They're amazing. And give them all the traction they deserve because they really have like the most amazing skills anyway that's it for this week like i said it was a short one hope you had a great time listening though and and i hope you have a great week see you then